I'm Brookhaven Town Supervisor Ed Romaine. The current substance abuse epidemic is having a devastating impact on communities throughout Brookhaven Town, Suffolk County, and New York State. It's absolutely imperative for parents and guardians to educate themselves about drug abuse so we don't have to see our local youth continue to suffer. Through New York State Department of Justice, our town's youth bureau has received funding to produce the video you're about to watch. Many people were interviewed to give you a very real and well-rounded perspective of how drug and alcohol abuse negatively impacts the person who is struggling, their family, and loved ones as well. Please pay attention to what you're about to see. A lot of people poured their hearts into this video to make a difference in the lives of those who watch it. Some say that you're not even there. Some say you are, but you don't care. I'm wandering just like a little child. I'm running in circles, going wild. I'm searching, coming up, empty for miles, for miles. But you have me right away. Every 19 minutes, someone dies of an accidental prescription drug overdose. Most of the time, it involves an opiate. While heroin deaths continue to spike on Long Island, there's more awareness of the problem than ever before, but officials say it's only getting worse. The county medical examiner says he's never seen anything like this. He's calling it a public health crisis. A dangerous new substance is hitting the United States illegal drug market, and it is a drug that is so dangerous that both the users and the responders are put at risk by simply touching the drug. Agents charged the men were churning out hundreds of pills laced with fentanyl, considered up to a hundred times stronger than morphine, and lethal just by touching it. A drug addiction is killing hundreds of Long Islanders every year, and the victims are getting younger. Here's the president declaring war on the opioid epidemic. And I'm saying officially right now, it is an emergency. It originates in Mexico. They take it right out to places in Long Island, it's circulate in the neighborhoods. It's killing a lot of people. Heroin is one of the most dangerous drugs there is. Here in Brookhaven Town, heroin and opioid abuse has reached epidemic proportions. Sadly, in all of New York State, Suffolk County has the highest number of drug overdoses. It affects all ages, races, and genders in all economic backgrounds. In this video, you will see firsthand the ravages of addiction, the struggles of those recovering, and the life-changing impact it has on the lives of their loved ones. I woke up one morning and said, I have to get through that door. I'm not an early riser. Five o'clock in the morning, I woke up and something told me, divine intervention, said, get through that door, there's something wrong. And I had no clue my son ever did heroin. When I got through that door, he was stiff. He was, fell sideways with the needle next to him, the tourniquet on his arm, and he was blue. So I was actually at work um, and I received a phone call from his girlfriend. And she told me, I'm trying to reach Max and I can't get a hold of him, a police officer keeps picking up the phone. So um, I called the number and I said, um, this is his mother, Dorothy, I'm at work, I'm a nurse at St. Charles. Um, is he dead? Just tell me, is he dead?
I'm in a safe place, please just tell me. And they said yes. So I hung up the phone, I got in my car, and I remember screaming, and I couldn't stop. We picked the lock and got into the bathroom, and that's when we found the shower running, and my brother slumped over the bathtub. It was already blue and gray at that time. The day before my birthday, I got the phone call that he was dead. He had, I guess, taken either too much Xanax or was withdrawing from Xanax and Roxy's, which is horrible and painful. And he hanged himself from his basketball hoop in his driveway, and his little brother found him. And this is a person that I loved so much. In 2016, there were 52,000 Americans who lost their life to prescription and opioid overdose. 52,000, that's a rate we've never before seen. Here we are in the middle of a full-scale, full-blown epidemic in which we're losing countless numbers of young people. We see about 1,000 people a month, not some, not most, but every single one of them started with alcohol and marijuana. It seems to always start uh, at the early age of 12, 13, 14, that is the age of experimental use, according to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and it's one of three gateway drugs. The first, alcohol. The second is a very potent form of marijuana. This is not the marijuana of the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. And the last one is nicotine. But those three gateway drugs are quickly leading to the most powerful narcotics on the face of the planet, which has been a, a, a huge contributing factor, quite frankly, the current state of the epidemic. The reason why heroin specifically is such an addictive substance is, as people describe it, it's the greatest feeling that they ever had. So if you take somebody who has a family history of addiction and a propensity of their own to possibly become an addict, once you put that opioid into their system, they're going to know it. So take two examples. Take two people that go to the dentist. You have both of them are 21 years old, they're getting their wisdom teeth pulled out. Person A gets a prescription for Percocet, numbs his pain, makes him really nauseous, gets repulsed by it, throws the rest of the script away. Patient B takes that Percocet, the lights go on, the feeling is unbelievable, and the doors are opened. And then they go back to the dentist, possibly get more prescription, but at some point that prescription gets cut off or that prescription is no longer giving them that high that they like. And the next step oftentimes is stronger pills, sniffing the pills, and then going to heroin. Understanding this deadly enemy is the first step in understanding how to combat it. But most of us think addiction like this could never happen to us or our families. That only happens to other people. I want parents to think about all of these school events that they went to from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, and think about all those sweet kids that were singing songs in the chorus or playing football or playing basketball. Those kids are the kids who are using drugs. And their parents, just like you, thought my kid would never use drugs. I would say that all kids are inherently good. I think um, this isn't an issue of good and bad. People who use drugs or are dependent on drug use are not bad people were trying to get good. Oftentimes they are sick people that were trying to get well. That's a huge distinction. The image we have of a heroin user is not the reality that we're seeing today. When most people think heroin user, they think about a homeless guy kind of wandering around the Lower East Side with a needle in his arm. They don't think about the perky cheerleader from Sachem, from Rocky Point, from Sound Beach. I had experimented and tried pain medication, Xanax, and I would take it just here and there. And then that here and there turned into every day. It didn't take that much for me to be a disaster and for me to be a problem for myself or my family. I was addicted to Roxycodone, I believe is the like official name for it. We always just called it Roxy's, but it's opioids, um, 30 milligram opioids. They're like, yeah, they're just little pills and I would snort them. My drug of choice initially was cocaine. And then at 18 years old, I became a full-blown heroin addict. Um, started ingesting it 
uh, through my nose initially. And within about 10 days, I became an IV heroin addict. And that was something that I battled for the next 10 years. He had come home one night from uh, a party and he walked in, he said, Ma, I need to talk to you. And I said, what's the matter, Max? He said, I was at a party and some girl stuck a needle in my arm. I said, don't even kid around with me like that. That's, don't even talk to me like that. That's not funny. Because he would always joke around. And he broke down and he said, no, it's true. I said, Max, you're 6'4", 185 pounds. How could you have let this happen? Ma, I don't know. I'm scared. Please help me. I do believe that it is a disease that you're born with and you're playing Russian roulette. You could have 10 people taking a drug and they could walk away. But if you have that disease of addiction, that person can't stop. I would have sworn on my life that my son would be the last person on this earth to, have, to stick a needle in his arm. Your brain needs the medicine not to get high anymore, but just to function. I became physically addicted. That obsession would not let me put the drug down. I woke up every single morning sick as a dog. If I didn't have them, I was sick, I was throwing up, I was incapable of doing anything. It literally cost you 60 to $100 just to not be sick anymore. And that's every single day. My father had walked upstairs to see what I was doing and found me on the floor from an overdose from heroin. I was then rushed to the hospital and I woke up in ICU uh, three days later. I've overdosed probably four or five times. He said, I'm gonna go get heroin. I did a little bit and it was just calling my name, calling my name and then I just picked it up one day, and five years later was when I finally put it down. A day of being an active addict is you wake up, as the day goes on, if you don't have money, you get progressively sicker. So it's really a race against the clock. So you don't care about brushing your teeth, you don't care about taking a shower, you care about getting a, what, a certain amount of money to go use. And most times when you do have money, then the dealer doesn't answer. He'll tell you to be somewhere at a certain time and then not show up, have you waiting on the side of the road. I mean, it's literally, so not only are you, you hooked on a crazy drug, you have your drug dealer is literally your puppet master. All the people that I loved so much couldn't stand to look at me. And I realized that I hadn't looked at myself in the mirror in probably months. And that sounds like a weird thing to like sort of gauge. But I saw myself in the mirror one day and realized that I never once stopped ever to look in the mirror at myself because I didn't care. Like I let myself go completely. I didn't shower. I just laid in my bed all day because I was either sick or I was too messed up to do anything. Addiction ravages the addicted and it also devastates their families. Parents who have lost children will say to me, I just keep going over and over in my mind about what I might have done wrong. And the reality is you can do everything right, whatever right is, and still have a child that has a problem. First thing that goes through your mind is what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong as a parent? That's, that's the number one shame. And the shame of what is everybody gonna think? Being a sibling of an addict is not easy. It's very, very hard. Um, because it's not that you don't love the person, you are mad at them. The 13 years that my son, Anthony, suffered with this disease, so did I. And I wouldn't want it any other way. An addict is a hurt person. I was screaming at a person that was already down in the dirt. I was kicking a dog when he was down. He called heroin the devil. And um, he knew what it was doing to him. Uh, he wrote so many letters to myself and my husband, apologizing. One of the, the hardest parts about, you know, looking back on my experiences is thinking about the pain that I put my parents through. Um, and, and coming to 
terms with the fact that I was doing all of the things that I was doing. And at that time, I had um, no regard for how they were feeling or how it was impacting the family. The heroin made him the per a different person, and he was aware of that. There's a behavior change that's so horrible that turns them into someone that they're not. Men stealing from stores, you know, this disease makes me do things that I never, ever imagined, ever. You will scratch, claw, and kill to get your next fix. It's not even a choice. It's not, I don't even believe you're making a choice. It's not an option. You have to get it. I watched my son firsthand. He detoxed right in my home. And it was God awful to see your child in that much pain. When you're that sick, I mean, I can't even describe to you what dope sickness feels like. It is like the flu on a massive cycle of steroids. It is the worst thing you could ever go through. If the parents think that they're struggling now while their child is using, they have no idea how horrible it is to lose them. Although this crisis has been in the news a lot lately, most of us are still not sure what a parent should look for in their child. Pinpointing the warning signs is challenging because a lot of the same warning signs that you would associate with addiction are things that are endemic to adolescents. There is no coincidence that the reason experimental substance use happens at the most precarious time in human development, adolescence, when young people are pulling away from mom and dad and they're trying to develop new character and personality traits, they're experimenting with um, uh, new dialogue, new personas, new friend groups, uh, new digital and technological capabilities. This is a very difficult time for adolescents. I think there's a whole generation of young people up, uh, coming up who put so much pressure on themselves to succeed and in full view on their social media sites that we all suffer from a sense of inadequacy or low self-esteem at times of our lives. It's important to be able to work through mad, glad, scared, and sad. Mad, anger, sadness, melancholy or depressed move, uh, mood, scared, which stands for fear, forget everything and run, and here's glad or happiness or contentment. If you assign a pill or a powder or a drink or a potion to every one of these emotions at a very young age, you will begin a behavioral pattern that you'll take into later adolescence and into adulthood and can very much be the seedlings of a very serious illness called drug addiction. I think that kids have more pressure on them than ever with the use of social media through Instagram and Facebook. You know, how many likes can I get? How popular am I? Everything is judged off of that. So again, a kid that's uh, insecure, lonely, has low self-esteem, one crowd of people that will always accept somebody new, no matter what they look like, what their parents do for a living, or how they feel, is other addicts and a drug dealer. They will pull them in openly. And so when you think about the things that we professionals put out as warning signs, it's changes in mood, changing in sleeping habits, changes in friends, moodiness, changes in financial status. Those are all things that kids routinely experience anyway. Initially, you know, the, the epidemic was blamed on the doctors and Oxycontin, okay? So Oxycontin has been gone from the picture for a very long time, and heroin is still on the rise. I think it's a total breakdown in family structure. Families need to eat dinner together every night. Otherwise, you're not engaging in your child's life. I think that families, whatever religion they, they practice, they should be going to church together on Sundays or going to temple or whatever it is that they do. I think that families need to get back to spending time together. That way, if a problem does exist, you can catch it early. The other really important piece of advice for parents is trust your gut. Parents will say, you know what, I thought maybe something was happening. I wasn't sure. I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't know how to have the conversation. I didn't want to sound accusatory. In, in the midst of a crisis, it's all hands on deck and anything goes. If there's a basis to have a conversation, have the conversation now. We tell parents all the time, and I'm the first one to say it, when I was 14 years old, the last thing I wanted to do was my mom going through my room or taking my phone and going through my phone. But now as an adult and someone that might have a family someday, hey, listen, if they're living underneath your roof and they're underage and you pay for that cell phone bill and you think your child's doing something, go through their cell phone. Go on their Facebook, see who they're hanging out with. 
be more active in your child's life, less as a friend, but more as a parent. Realize who they're hanging out with. Because yeah, Stacy, your daughter Stacy might not be dabbling with drugs or anything, but Timmy and Jen that she hangs out with every day might be drinking and smoking pot. What do you think is gonna happen to Stacy one day? She's gonna, might potentially get pressured into smoking that joint. I think now we have to be the generation that's the change. We can't be scared of this because there's too many people losing lives. I'm doing this from my heart because I don't want to see another mother, father, sister, brother go through the pain that I've gone through and that I have to live with for the rest of my life. It was my only child. I wanted to send a message not only to our community, but to parents throughout Suffolk County. Um, I planted the tree as a symbol of growth and awareness. And as the tree grows, I pray that awareness grows. In order to break the chains of addiction, it takes courage, determination, and lots of support. Without question, this is the most important journey of an addict's life. We know that prevention works. We know that treatment is effective when it's done at the right time for the right duration. And we know that recovery is possible for young people. There is hope after dope and that there is recovery. Recovery is a real thing. It happens. Uh, and there's lots of living proof for people that recover from whatever their addiction may be. Everybody has reasons why they use drugs. So I started to work on that. What, what made me pick up to begin with? That was my way out of addiction. The difference between this time and all the other times of me getting clean was being transparent with my disease of addiction. I worked on the reasons why I got high to begin with. I went back in time through the writing, figured it out, figured my patterns and worked on that stuff. And, and that was the first thing as far as my recovery consists of loving myself. I got the help that I needed because I finally just, something just clicked that I was like, I, I'm going to die. Either I'm going to overdose and die because at that point I was doing 10 a day if I could afford it and not thinking anything of it. Or I'm going to kill myself because I'm so unhappy. My parents are two of the most patient and loving people um, in the world. And, um, you know, even at my lowest, um, they continue to try to help me to the best of their ability. If you're a sibling of an addict, you have a huge responsibility and you have an amazing chance to save someone's life. We have one chance at this life. It's so short. Let's get through it together. I know together we can do it. As we look at all of this misery, the hope is that we're talking about a preventable disease. We're talking about something that if you wind up with the symptoms of it, it's treatable. And there's an increasing number of people here on Long Island, statewide and across the United States that have found a path to recovery. And that club's getting to be a pretty big one. I don't think about getting high 10 years active IV heroin user, six bundle a day heroin user, IV cocaine user, homeless, not a struggle for me anymore. It became like a matter of me knowing that it was between life and death for me and seeing the effect that it had on all the people that I did truly love and hadn't been able to show it because I was a shell of myself. Because I truly believe my brother sacrificed his life so I could speak in his honor. I thank God every day for my parents because they never gave up on me. I would love to say to every parent, no matter what they're going through, stand by your child. You have nothing else in this life that is more important than them. I've been broken, you put me together When I was stranded, you gave me shelter When I was lost, you found me And you wrapped me up into your arms Oh, when I see a rock, you see a diamond When I think it's too late, you see perfect 
time in your kingdom, this old world creator of all. You know every single mistake, you catch me when I fall. Perfect time in your king of this old world, creator of all. You know every single mistake. You catch me when I fall. The name of the organization is Michael's Hope. Hope stands for Heroin and Opiate Prevention and Education. We do uh, free Narcan trainings to the communities on Long Island, as well as uh, educational seminars. Narcan is, is the opiate reversal, and we provide uh, trainings to properly administer Narcan to individuals that might be in need. I took it on as my responsibility that if it's my generation dying, then I need to be the one to do what I have to do to save my generation. I'm one of the owners of Long Island Helps Recovery Initiation. Spending the majority of my adolescent and 20s in treatment centers. I've come into contact with thousands of addicts. Addicts and their family members develop resources here in Long Island for those struggling with addiction or alcoholism. We also speak in schools, um, host Narcan trainings and community meetings every week, as well as do interventions. I know that I had to do something. And as hard as it is, you know, people would ask me, why are you doing this? I said, because I have to. If it can happen to my son, I have to let other people know that it can happen to them. If you know anyone who is struggling with substance abuse or addiction, please call the Town of Brookhaven's Youth Bureau at 631-451-8011. A member of our staff will provide excellent information, resources, and referrals. Thank you.